All right, go ahead. Let it rip, Rick. All right. Hey, so welcome, everyone, to another episode of uh, Knit 6. And today we're going to talk about something that's kind of, uh, you know, near and dear to, to my heart and a journey that's been going down is focusing on IoT security and zero trust. But before we get into that, we've actually got a new member to the Init 6 team that I wanted to uh, introduce. Uh, Elliot Dirksen joined us as a longtime uh, CCIE. You want to introduce yourself real quick, Elliot? Hi, uh, Elliot Dirksen. I'm a network engineer for a uh, integrator in Florida, uh, route switch and collaboration IE and IT Graybeard. Um, been in IT since mid 80s. And, you, and that's a, uh, a CCIE's home lab, if I've ever seen one. <laughs> He's got more behind him than Derek does. He doesn't have I can post Jackson, pictures though. of the rack. Yeah. So to kick this thing off, I figured we'd start with kind of the set the, the, the tone for kind of what the challenges are is with, you know, it comes to IoT. And, you know, the interesting thing in, in you know, my career is that, that you know originally what was connected in the enterprise was you know kind of desktops and workstations and single devices then we had the mobile that was kind of the early 2000s and all the mobile devices started connecting which created a new challenge for it organizations to uh onboard those devices and allow them within the enterprise things like ipads and stuff for byod type services well now we've kind of shifted to what is um, you know kind of coined by some as hyper connected where everything that could be connected in the enterprise is essentially being connected and so we see this today with cameras and stoplights and and on manufacturing floor robots and uh, in hospitals the average hospital bed today you have about 11 connected devices for every one bed in the hospital so even the beds are connected to they have solutions out there that if uh, there's no weight on the bed, they can tell when it's kind of empty or somebody's in it. So this has created kind of a whole new paradigm shift because these devices that are, are now part of the network, so much of our security has been based upon the users behind them, right? As our policies are based upon, you know, logging into Active Directory or something and getting a certain set of credentials uh, pushed down because by user. Well, these devices have no user, so nobody's logging into them daily and using them. So they're kind of sitting out there. Uh, and, you know, if y'all remember a couple of years ago, a lot of these devices have been used for attacks. And um, one of those, like, I mean, I don't, I don't want to mention you know, any names, but a large retail organization, there was an attack that came in through the uh, AC system. But there's been an, uh, an extreme explosion of these devices. And this is, you know, one of the Gartner statistics, and I won't spend a lot of time on here, but the you know, estimated uh, in the billions of devices now connected globally has created this whole surge that you see over the last, just the last five years, really. And now we're uh, almost to, um, you know, 8 billion. And then there's some estimates that we could be at 10 to 15 billion by, by next year. And that's going to be one of the interesting things that, that, you know, I believe coming out of this, you know, quarantine and this COVID environment is there's going to be a lot more connected devices um, as they look to, you know, do jobs and stuff that human beings are, you know, now they're now quarantined can, you know, get visibility in there. Any comments or questions on that? Yeah, but you mentioned, I mean, the problems within the, uh, I guess the hospital environment and the business environment, right? But I'm pretty sure this is a this is actually a cause of concern for residential, right? For residential IoT devices as well. Yeah, actually, right. The so with the everybody working from home now, right? That but still connecting into those corporate assets, that is certainly a new attack vector, right? Where one of those devices at your house, if they get compromised or somebody gets access to that, that could potentially be a backdoor into um, an enterprise network, and so you know. If if your your VPN isn't just enough because that's connected in, you've got to see what people are doing on that. I mean, these are some examples of of certain kinds of use cases and things. I mean, we've seen in in the couple of years that I've been doing IoT security, we've seen Bitcoin mining in medical devices, and these aren't just one or two kind of you know little things. These are like MRI machines, big types of medical devices, and important you know critical infrastructure. Yeah, I mentioned earlier that there was an attack that came through on the retail side on the AC system. So 
<clears throat> and that's, you know, traditional security of the way we've secured PCs and laptops and stuff is, is these IoT devices are running, a lot of them are Raspberry Pi type devices are running some other type of headless Windows or headless, um, you know, Linux installation or something. And so you can't install an agent on them. So also too, a lot of these devices are essentially appliances, like manufacturers won't let you access the operating system because they're, they're appliances that are just doing a job. And so you can't install an agent on them. So in, in uh, most environments today, the way that those have been attacked is through some type of NAC system, right? Which has created its own kind of challenges of where you're doing kind of workstations and onboarding of these guest devices. And, uh, but a lot of these are the same kinds of um, operating systems. And so it's difficult to tell that, oh yes, this is an IOT device. NAC systems like ICE and stuff have historically um, struggled with the profiling of these devices and end up like lumping them together. And so where customers spend a lot of time is chipping away at the iceberg of figuring out, oh yes, that is my MRI machine, or that is actually this camera. Make sense about the, the limitations of, you know, legacy types of security. And so one of the things that, that you know, I, I kind of never, so the answer in ICS and SCADA environments has been, you know, I've probably heard of like the Purdue model. That's, you know, full, well-segmented network and, and things where you have these certain defined zones that uh, connected assets sit in that are doing their jobs there. And then you may have firewalls between the different levels or a firewall when it comes out of the ICS environment. And so we've had these well-defined and segmented zones, but you know, this doesn't protect against somebody putting it in the wrong zone, right? I, I've seen medical devices that are in guest Wi-Fi because a lot of times that's the path of least resistance. It's the easiest thing. So, you know, sometimes human beings take take the path of least resistance and just stick it up out there to, to get it up. I, I imagine with the, you know, with the focus being on uh, saving lives today and dealing with COVID patients that they're just connecting devices and putting them out there so that they can just get them hooked up and started. And so I, I, I would imagine there are a lot of medical devices that are on in certain, you know, um, you know, hospital organizations and stuff right now. And also too, another paradigm shift that in addition to all the devices that are being connected, the next big shift, this is a kind of a new Purdue model that's been kind of, you know, proposed is is now you've got the in a, you know cloud right just like cloud has changed um you know data centers and applications and stuff cloud is also changing how things are connected because you've got things like cameras and sensors and stuff that need to call back home i mean look at your your nest thermostats in your house or amazon alexis right speaker phones and things that connect up into the cloud so how do you, you can't have these well-defined zones where they can only communicate with things in the zones and then just, or they may move up to some type of control. So this is kind of, you know, cloud is, is really impacting how network segmentation and, and architecture is. Uh, when it comes to handling IoT, um, creating some new challenges. Well, most of, most of which, I mean, we went from things to cloud, we went from having a centralized security mechanism for, getting to the internet for enterprise to now most enterprises have have adopted a distributed approach right to give their end users to put their end users closer to access to the cloud so uh that can be easy to protect against right and if you notice in this new model right there's instead of your connected devices kind of sitting oh i went to my other monitor there down at these lower levels this iot zone spans the entire stack right because there's going to be connected assets at each layer. And this includes, to your point, those teleworkers, right? People, uh, you know, using iPads and stuff out in the field. Okay. Connecting back. I mean, that's another thing about, you know, 5G is going to be that. I didn't mention it here, but that's that next wave of kind of connected devices. And what 5G is being touted as is really connecting things in like cars and you know, all um, Tesla's and every every model of automobile manufacturer, in addition to all the stuff at like stop signs, traffic lights and flashers and things like that, right? Okay. So, you know, at the end of the day, the, the whole goal of these models and stuff is to is to segment. 
And so that's where you all, you all probably heard the term a lot of uh, zero trust. It's something that's been kind of thrown around and what a lot of organizations are trying for. And what that means is that I don't trust anything before it connects until I verify, right? Whereas now we've got a trust and verify model in a lot of organizations where things get plugged in and connected and then we'll come back later and kind of put them in the right VLAN or segment or move them around or you know do some type of access list on a firewall later. Um, the, the whole goal is to get to zero trust where the moment something uh, plugs into a port or connects to an access point, that I verify exactly what it is and then I put it in the right bucket. And that's what this slide is showing. So as things come onto the network, they get put into their bucket, which inherently gets the policies applied to it. So my MRI machine gets a different policy than a environmental sensor or a network camera. So so this this slide right here is just detecting the, the type of device and putting them logically in a kind of an identifier, right? Kind of a container, right? Yeah, or this is what, you know, uh, zero trust is all about is identifying what it is and then putting it in the right bucket. Now that's, you know, a, a, a virtual, you know, container, VLAN, subnet. I mean, there's any number of different things that the buckets can be, right? But that's that's what it's it's meant to be. Whereas I know exactly what it is before it connects and whether or not I can trust it. Okay, so you're saying is it segmented or is it just informational? Is yeah, it really and a lot of them, the, the whole goal is to get to segmentation, right? Where you're, you've got a physical security VLAN, right? At the fundamental layer. Uh, that's different than your voice net, your voice VLAN, right? That all your phones are on, which is different than your mobile device VLAN, right? Your facilities may have their own VLANs. And then within each of these kinds of VLANs, you may have, you know, um different areas are even overlapping vlans at different sites that are you know they're from a from a connectivity and network perspective they're different right but they're still with the same uh grouping of devices yeah. you know one of the things that i see here is this is great if you're starting with a green field but if you're trying to bring this sort of thing into an existing network where you already have you know all kinds of devices that you may not even know what's attached it's a it's a particular challenge to identify things and start to build the policies so that they end up in the right place when you're trying to deal with a large existing network no absolutely right i mean there's you know companies have had networks for for decades now right but these iot devices are only you know a couple of years old and, and so uh, while things like you know, cameras have been connected for a while. Things like, and, and mobile devices, right, that you see here, and printers. Printers have been connected forever. We have defined uh, VLANs for phones and printers and cameras and stuff, but you don't have a defined VLAN for like MRI machine or a bed or a robotic arm on a manufacturing floor, those kinds of things. So it's creating new groups. And, you know, sometimes, you know, we all deal with in our in our normal job, shadow IT, right? All organizations deal with somebody going out and getting an Alexa um, and plugging it in and connecting it, right? Well, Which creates a whole new set of challenges, especially in like healthcare. Well, going back to what Elliot said, it, it kind of, you know, because as soon as Elliot mentioned that, you kind of nightmares of other deployments, right? Because you go to most customer environments and all this, you know, which means the IP phones, the printers, the, the other security devices, uh, you wouldn't be surprised the sensors if they were all just lumped up in one, you know, VLAN unsegmented and what have you. Um, but when you're coming in to do, you know, some kind of zero trust, whatever, it's it's a lot of work to go through and manually identify uh, each device, let alone manually uh, uh, kind of um, uh, segment each device. So oh, yeah. no, absolutely right. I mean, and also to it, it um, like I was mentioned earlier. It doesn't prevent somebody from taking the easy route and putting a device on guest, right? Because it's easier than open up a ticket, right? <laughs> and going through change control. Right. I mean, we've all run into that. I mean, that's human nature, unfortunately, right? And so that's where things like next, next solutions um, that are supposed to put things in the right bucket, um, once they, they're challenged to implement because of the profiling and stuff. And so that's what this kinds of, you know, when it comes to IoT, 
a lot of those legacy NAC systems are based upon some simple things like, you know, manufacturer OUI, right? Um, and when it comes to IoT, you can't go by that at all. Uh, because what you see on the left there is just Googling like, you know, Raspberry Pi devices. And those can be anything from a traffic light to just somebody building, you know, a, a sensor that's using the, uh, the GPIO inputs of the, um, on the Raspberry Pi for temperature or something, right? Um, um, when, if you've done any kind of NAC deployments, I think some of us on here have, one of the big things that you'll see in like you know, Cisco ICE is that a lot of things show up as like Digiboard. That's a common NIT manufacturer that is in a lot of devices. And so then you have to chip away at that iceberg and figure out, oh, well, this Digiboard, because of this IP is really this device. And then you, you know, it's, it's a manual thing. And in large enterprises, that, that can take months to even years to go through all sites and um, you know, figure out all the devices. And, and also, too, device manufacturers change NICs depending upon make and model of devices. So the next generation of a device may not have the same NIC. So it will have a different OUI. So you can't always go on, go on NIC because, um, you know, you never know what it, what it is. Gotcha. And then also, too, the, the, the you know, uh, the adoption of consumer devices into enterprise through BYOD. And now um, the, you know, the example here on the screen is, you know, the iPad on the left where a doctor is accessing, you know, a picture of somebody's knee and patient data and using that for a business service. That iPad, while technically classified, if you're going on a Mac, you, uh, that's, that's right, it's an iPad. But that iPad is very different from a business value standpoint than the iPad on the, on the right where you know just a user surfing netflix okay right? gotcha. so, so yep. looking at the device those are going to appear the same but from a policy perspective you want different things within the business right and so that's where behavior and what the you know it goes to the the, the cisco uh the intent based networking it's not just intent of the users right it's also intent of what's going on with the device and so that's why kind of if you look at that organizations that want to really implement IoT security and also zero trust, there's really four key components uh, to that. The first is that knowing what's out there and what's connected. And then two, knowing what the behavior is and seeing the flows and how it's. Hey, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Oh. So knowing the flows and how it's connected and how it's behaving so that from here, from one to two, we can move that iPad to um, out there to the doctor accessing the data so that now that becomes a medical iPad based on the behavior. And then you wanna get over to the right, which is where you're actually putting it in policy, whether that's a, you know, an, an, an Ansible policy or a NAC policy or a simple ACL or a VLAN, some type of network construct that is assigned to that, that device and, and then enforcing that policy, right? And so really you can break it up into two different areas. You've got device intelligence here on the left of knowing what it is and what its function is and how it relates to the business. And then one on the right is the network enforcement pieces, which can be firewall or some type of controller if it's a wireless um, or NAT solution or simple access list on a switch or you know, Mac, uh, Mac enforcement. Make sense? Perfect sense. So, so these are some of the kind of the challenges that, you know, in each of these different buckets that, that you'll hear kind of customers talking about as one, I've got no visibility into what's actually connected. And, and a lot of times it's just because a lot of enterprises have, you know, grown organically through merger and acquisitions. They don't know what they had because they didn't deploy, right? Um, and so they're stuck with these legacy architectures and connections that, that they have no clue. And, you know, it's, it's, it's a big task to go out and, you know, uh, trace those cables and figure out exactly what's connected. Um, these are the challenges in organizations, but I can tell you that at least from an organization, knowing the customer standpoint, what have you, um, uh, number one is, is a huge problem, right? Uh, because no one wants to 
best. I don't say no one. That's a bad assumption, right? Uh, it, it's very tedious and very time consuming to go in to do number one. You know, uh, and this goes back to to Elliot's old point. But number two, three, and four. <laughs> every organization wants this automated, and 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 you know that's where technology has to, and that's what organizations are thinking, right? Two, three, and four uh, are are things that. Um, are things that needs to be, you know, uh, dynamic with with solutions and so forth. So that's just when you say challenges, uh, it's not that you know number two, three, and four is a challenge to implement. It's <laughs> you don't want to have to, you know, go in from scratch and be able to set policies and things and and in, in, into a life cycle environment. If you will, absolutely right. I mean, kind of you know our previous sessions where we focused on like DevOps and things like that. The that's kind of this this right piece, right? Um, and now we're bringing that automation over here on the left because you know a lot of these. Let's face it, inventory. There's still a lot of places out there where their inventory is five or six different spreadsheets, right? The facilities has their own spreadsheet, and uh, clinical and biomed and healthcare has their own. Right. So this inventory problem is um, not just, you know, unique to one environment. And also, too, that's even if a, even if a solution has like a service now, like a CMDB, uh, some type of centralized asset database, a lot of times that's not accurate. Right. And not, and not dynamic enough. And the idea as well, what can drive building or tracking an inventory? will be also, uh, sometimes it can be security driven. You have, you have numerous numbers of devices in your network that, that, that communicate without user and login. So you can track a user to login from them. But you, um, so machine to machine communications, you don't know anything about it, about them actually. So you have a, a large attack services. You don't know exactly how they are secured. They are actually in, can interoperate with each other, or can actually, or are they doing the right job for their um, uh, for for their purpose of built? But the idea that I need beside asset management and inventory collection, I need as well. See, there is a security aspect of it. I need to make sure those IoT devices, uh, machine to machine devices, will not uh, like. Uh, cause any or will not be the entrance for any attack internally or externally. Yeah. And, and also too, when it comes to IOT, um, not every device is a big device. Like it's not all like, you know, robot manufacturers and floor and stuff. A lot of the IOT devices are transient in nature. Like they're wireless, they're coming and going, they're moving around. And also too, they're meant to be disposable. So from an inventory and tracking, perspective that gets even more complex because the assets are more disposable. I mean, think about, you know, how many iPads that, you know, organizations go through because somebody drops it and the screen cracks or something like that. And you're just, they're throwaway assets, just like, you know, kind of our society is a more disposable society. Um, connected devices are also becoming more and more disposable because, you know, instead of troubleshooting a, you know, a $35 Alexa, right. It's, you can go add that, you know, just it's 35 bucks. Right. Or it's a hundred bucks for a Raspberry Pi. Go buy a new one. Right. So that brings us back to you know, still number one being that most critical component uh, Absolutely. And, and a very difficult because I, I can see the number one, uh, it, it, in fact, would would even alter a company's, you know, uh, roadmap onto even I, attacking this. It's even, you know, going into a hospital environment or going to a industrial customer this has to be some kind of roadblock right if you will in order for companies to be able to spend that capital money to to address right the fact that it's such a big task to come back and 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 do number one so yeah i mean and that, this is where everybody kind of needs to start right and you got to get a good handle on that before you can even talk about any of these other two three and four right and so a lot of organizations that you know want to start down this path can just focus on tackling number one right um and that that kind of inventory what's connected and so well, you know you could run into a, you could run into another case where you have devices that change behavior you know if you get an ipad that comes on your wireless and they're mm -hmm. 
launching yep. Animal Crossing, you're going to assume it's a guest network. But suppose you've got an iPad that's tied, that's controlling an x-ray machine, and in between appointments, the x-ray tech decides they want to play Animal Crossing. Now, do you move that one into your guest network, and now it now it can't control the device that it's supposed to control? And that's a and that's a behavior's key, right? I mean, first you got to know what it is, and then once it gets connected, it's not a one-time event, right? A lot of times with with NAC, when that device first connects, it's profiled once, and it's a one-time event. You can't do that today because devices behave differently and serve different functions. Um, the good thing about IoT is because they're purpose built, their behavior should be very predictable. So it should be a very predictable model. However, like to your point, um, you know, there's still user coaching opportunities for people, you know, using business devices for personal information and stuff, right? Um, that happens, right? And so that's why we're monitoring the behavior over time, uh, over the whole life cycle, and automatically making changes is is key. And and that whole need is is kind of opens up a new kind of security market where there's these are some of the kind of the players out there that if you're interested in looking at more um, about that, where these um, solutions all use AI and machine learning in some form to automatically identify the assets, put them in the right buckets, and then help with the automation of the enforcement along the way. And, you know, this kind of started with, um, uh, um, you know, like Zingbox in the, on the right there, 2015, which has now been acquired by Palo Alto. And uh, Cisco acquired Centrio last year, which has now been rebranded as CyberVision. And so that right. so kind of IoT visibility uh, solution. Aruba developed their own, you know, device insights, and then you've got other leaders out there like Order and Mitigate and Armis, what are are using, um, you know, it's kind of some of the similar things of classifying these assets and then connecting to the different pieces.